previous genetic screens. So these were known proteins that had been implicated by genetic evidence in yeast and the regulation of transcription. Uh, the screens were done on different promoters at different times in different laboratories uh, with the discovery of mediator in this form by Dorfman and Kim. Uh, the products of those diverse screens were united in a common biochemical entity. Still, the mediator idea did not gain wide acceptance, and the reason was the studies of transcriptional regulation in higher cells, including human cells, uh, focused on evidence for direct interaction of an activator protein with the general transcription factor D, and in particular its TAF subunits. Finally, in 1998, we and others succeeded in isolating a mammalian counterpart of the yeast mediator, and genetic studies in yeast showed that the role of the TAF subunits of factor D was in promoter recognition rather than in regulation. Uh, to underline the uh, conservation to which I have alluded, what you see here is simply to illustrate fully 22 of now 25 yeast mediator proteins known have counterparts in higher cells, such as in human and Drosophila. Now, we've only just begun to fathom the complexity of mediator, but already three points are abundantly clear. The first is, mediator is not only important for regulation, it's required for all transcription of virtually all RNA polymerase promoters. It is not less essential for transcription than the polymerase itself. Second point is that mediator, we now know especially from studies in the human system, forms tight complexes with virtually every activator. Mediator, as I will show you later, interacts directly with RNA polymerase too, and in this way, it brings about the transmission of information, of regulatory information, from enhancer DNA elements to promoters. Now, mediator is commonly referred to in the literature as a coactivator, uh, but I often say this is a misnomer because mediator, we know from the genetic evidence in yeast especially, is equally important for negative regulation of transcription. Indeed, mediator is a coactivator, a co-repressor, and as I have indicated, a general transcription factor all in one. So by way of summary, then, mediator processes and also transmits regulatory information from enhancers to promoters in the entire range of eukaryotes, from yeast to human cells. So the complete transcriptional machinery, then, uh, comprises the set of proteins shown here. Now, uh, some of you will have heard a dictum that is often attributed to Francis Crick, if you wish to understand function, study structure. The problem in this case is the size and the complexity of the structure. So nearly 60 proteins assemble in a giant complex of 3 million dolphins at every RNA polymerase to promoter prior to the initiation of transcription. Um, we began structural studies with RNA polymerase II itself, a component of this machinery, itself a giant assembly of a dozen proteins greater than half a million molecular weight. We did so because RNA polymerase II forms the core of the machinery. As I will show you, it is the platform upon which all the other components are assembled. Indeed, as will be apparent from what I have to tell you, uh, if we had instead pursued structures of some of the smaller, simpler general transcription factors, our efforts would have been in part in vain. Some of these molecules only adopt well-defined structures in the context of the complexes that they form with the polymerase. And as I think you'll see especially, knowledge of the polymerase structure really is the key to understanding transcription. Now, the story of our pursuit of the RNA polymerase structure begins, as Stefan has indicated, in my own graduate work uh, with uh, the discovery of the rapid lateral diffusion of lipid molecules in single or multilayers. Uh, some years after doing that work, I uh, was a postdoctoral fellow in Cambridge, England, where I learned about uh, the development by Aaron Klug and colleagues of electron crystallography, a method especially suited to determine the structures of very large assemblies of protein molecules. Electron crystallography, as the name implies, requires an ordered array of molecules, only they might, the array must be extremely thin to allow transmission of an electron microscope beam. Now, in their original work, Klug and colleagues especially studied naturally occurring ordered arrays, such as 
uh, viral shells, uh, muscle fibers, and what have you. Uh, the, the limitation of the approach was the lack of a general method of forming such arrays from any protein of interest. And it occurred to me at some point that I might exploit the rapid lateral diffusion of lipid molecules to this end. So a protein of interest could be absorbed, bound to a lipid molecule, in this way constrained in two dimensions, but nonetheless free to move laterally due to the diffusion of the lipid molecules. After some years, uh, this approach proved to be effective. It was possible by this device to form single layer thick crystals of virtually any protein that we undertook. And in uh, 1988, 89, and early 90, Seth Darst and Al Edwards were finally successful in making single layer thick crystals of RNA polymerase II. Now the first crystals that they made were too small and also not sufficiently well ordered for a meaningful structural analysis. But we could take advantage of the ease, the rapidity, the very small amount of protein needed to form a single layer crystal and use this approach as a kind of structural assay to develop a preparation of RNA polymerase that would form better crystals. And it soon emerged that the <clears throat> that the problem was variability of <clears throat> the subunit composition of the RNA polymerase II preparation with respect to two subunits, four and seven larger subunits of the enzyme. Although these two subunits make up only 8% of the mass of RNA polymerase II, their presence in a variable amount in our preparations was the impediment to crystallization. Uh, we could overcome this difficulty by recourse to a, a yeast mutant strain in which the gene for the fourth subunit was deleted. Protein isolated from that strain uh, proves to lack also the seventh largest subunit, and that form of the enzyme, uh, while fully active in transcription, uh, now possesses the property of forming large, exceedingly well-ordered single-layer crystals. These could then be exploited as seeds to bring about the growth of three-dimensional crystals through a process of epitaxial crystal growth, uh, three-dimensional crystals uh, amenable to X-ray analysis for structure determination at high resolution. Now, I often point out that uh, I can recall that at the time when we first grew 3D crystals, uh, we were elated. I mean, it was something we thought perfectly extraordinary, and we, of course, could appreciate uh, the potential. But at the same time, I mean, I, I remember I myself felt a chill of anxiety because I knew polymerase was about a fifth the size of the largest protein that had ever been solved. And for sure, the uh, intensities of synchrotron X-ray beams that were available at the time, the speed of the detectors for recording, the diffraction intensities, computer speed for processing the data, uh, and especially uh, the method of multiple isomorphous replacement for solving the phases for protein structures were plainly inadequate uh, for the task of solving such a large protein structure. As it happened, it really didn't matter that the technology was inadequate because the crystals didn't diffract. <laughs> uh, the problem would have ended there were it not for Al Edwards noticing that the crystals were faintly tinged with yellow. The problem was oxidation, and the solution was ever after to purify the protein through the final steps and then grow and manipulate the crystals in a glove box in an inert atmosphere. At that point, uh, Jinhua Fu uh, undertook the uh, first phasing of the diffraction. The crystals diffracted at that, at that time to five to six ohms resolution. And he was successful with large heavy atom clusters. 